In this video, we'll take a look at an FPGA development board, which is based on the Altera Cyclone 4 family part. And let's ask the question, would this make a good FPGA development board for retro computing? If you take a look through our YouTube channel, you'll see that we've done a series of videos on a Cyclone 2 part used as a retro computer and the Cyclone 4 part used on this uh, particular FPGA development card has about twice the storage capacity as the one that was used on the other card we made. And it had enough storage capacity, uh, could squeeze in a 6502 base design or Z80 or uh, 6809, anything sort of from that generation. Here's the card we're going to take a look at. It's based on EP4 CE6. FPGA from Altera. It's a member of the Cyclone 4 family and the card goes for a little bit under $40 with free shipping. Uh, not a bad price, a little bit higher than some other FPGA cards, but look at the features. We'll see what they are. Here's the FPGA development board we used for our previous design. It uh, only has the FPGA. It doesn't have any extra connectors beyond the FPGA and the things it takes to program the FPGA. Everything else is brought out to pin headers, so we had to build a daughter card to adapt to it. This is what you get when you open up the box with the FPGA card. You get a USB A to B cable, an IR remote, and the FPGA development board itself. Nothing else. No documentation. No nothing. The card is well constructed. It um, is clean solder. Uh, looks like the solder was all cleaned off the card, or the residue was all cleaned off the card. And uh, nicely laid out. Lots of space between things. Uh, looks like a pretty nice card all in all. At the center of the card is the FPGA, member of the Cyclone 4 family. Uh, it's a little bit older chip, uh, a little bit more expensive than the Cyclone 2 that we used on our first retro computer, but we did play around with the Cyclone 4 um, as shown in the previous slide there. Um, we did play around with that on a, the same retro computer base card and were able to get it working just fine with uh, quite a bit of extra capacity, about twice the requirement space for a 6502 or 6809 base design. The first big thing that separates this card from the previous cards that just have FPGAs is there's a synchronous DRAM on the card, uh, 1 meg by 4 banks by 16 bits, which is a lot of space, but it is an SD RAM, so it will have some access issues compared to regular SRAM. We're taking a close look at the parts used here because there isn't a lot of information on the internet. Here's the data sheet for the SD RAM that's used on the card. The speed grade of the part that's installed on the card is a Dash 6 part, which is uh, 166 megahertz or PC 166 uh, grade part. It's organized as 1 meg by 4 banks by 16 bits, which uh, should be quite a bit of memory for a card like this, but being SD RAM, it'll have row and column addresses perhaps and other complications, um, maybe including refresh and other things. I think the reference design that they have, um, which I can't quite find yet uh, very easily, uh, it seems to have some designs for that and I believe it's built into the Altera part, but so far I've only played with SRAM, so I don't know how much more complicated the SD RAM is going to be. One of the things that got me excited about the card when I saw it on eBay was the I.O. connector, 26 pin connector that brings out quite a bit of the FPGA pins. But I believe from what I've been able to tell, these are also shared with VGA. So it's not really useful for a retro computer where you want to use VGA at the same time. Anyway, here are the pins that are used, um, which is nice to have. It's kind of hard to see in the picture um, on the eBay site. It might be visible, but not quite as easy here as in this snapshot. Now, a helpful bit of information is that the board is marked as ZR TAC version 2.00, and a search of that on the internet is what led me to a schematic, uh, which I believe is probably accurate based on what I could tell from the eBay listing, although we're going to look through it and verify it. But that should give uh, hints as to what to find. But there really isn't a good website with a wiki or anything like that, like, not like the Waveshare and maybe some of the other FPGA cards. So this is going to be perhaps a little bit more of a struggle. We'll see. One thing about the card is that it's very well marked, although quite a bit of it's marked in Chinese. Um, not quite sure what to make of that, but the port that you plug the 
USB blaster into to download the card is marked clearly as JTAG. So that does help. Um, the bits of marking on here should go a long ways. I just don't have any idea what to do with the Chinese marking on here. If anyone knows, uh, wouldn't mind knowing uh, in the comments, um, maybe perhaps below the DS1 might be the port number. I don't know any Chinese, so and I don't know how to translate or find a translation for a screenshot like that. Hopefully, though, the ZR Tech 2.0 marking will help identify some of the information about the card. Here you can see a four-digit, seven-segment LED, which uh, takes up some lines, and then five LEDs below that. Um, I guess a nice feature, although I'd rather have had the I.O. for that connected out through the I.O. connector. I'm not entirely sure why manufacturers and designers of these cards find a bunch of LEDs more useful than having all I.O. connections or in superior I.O. connections. I would think that VGA and uh, PS2 keyboard connections would be a little bit more important than an LEDs on the card, particularly if you're going to put something like this in a box. Uh, a lot of switches and lights just add extra things that you can't see anyway when it's built in a box. Scanning around the card, the next thing we see is a flash memory, serial flash, that's a pretty large flash. I'm, I'm actually a little surprised they're getting to be this big. The data sheet for the serial flash shows it to be a 32 megabits, or if it was in bytes, that would be 4 megabytes uh, serial flash, which is a pretty good size flash, and it's SPI, and so it claims there to run at 100 megahertz. Probably not likely given the 50 megahertz oscillator on this card, but uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll play with that and find out what it can do. Next part over is an EPCS4, which is the configuration uh, configuration serial EEPROM for the FPGA. Uh, you load the program into there to have it loaded into the FPGA when it comes on. And uh, that's a pretty typical part for it. That's a little smaller than the one that's on the other card I had, which was a 16. So that's going to be interesting. I don't think there should be a problem with that, though. We'll see. Next chip over is an analog to digital converter. The data sheet for the ADC is, shows that it's an 8-bit part and it'll run about 40,000 samples per second. So not a screamer, but probably fine for a lot of things. I am impressed that there's an SMA connector on here. That's a nice touch. Here's the block diagram from the data sheet for the A to D converter. And it uh, looks like it has a switch capacitor style converter and has an internal system clock inside of it. So um, looks like a pretty nice part, not overly complicated, hopefully, and we'll find out how it works. There's a power switch in the bottom corner of the card, and uh, that's a nice feature. I would have liked to have had pads, perhaps. Maybe I could desolder it if I really had to. Um, again, if this thing's going to go into a box, a power switch that's located internally is not all that useful to me. The USB connector is a bigger connector, like the kind you would find on an original Arduino Uno. Um, don't really see those on a lot of designs nowadays. They seem to be uh, favoring either micro or mini USBs, but I think I like that. It's uh, usually a pretty solid connection and uh, might be better considering power for the card comes in through that connector. The USB connector hooks up to a USB to serial converter on the card, which is nice because we've typically just plugged in an FTDI card externally, but it'd be nice to have it on the card like this. I think that's going to be a pretty useful function. One of the things I really liked was that all of the connections, the USB, PS2, and VGA connections are all out one edge, which really would make this nice for sticking in an enclosure. The USB to serial chip is a PL2303 by Prolific. Not really familiar with the company. Um, not really sure how well the part works. I assume it's a standard good part. Looks like the date on it was 2007, so maybe it's been out for a while. Maybe I'll have to load a driver. We'll find out. Here's the block diagram for the USB to serial converter. Uh, looks like it's got a couple of 256 byte buffers in it and pretty much the standard stuff that you would expect out of something like an FTDI sort of a function. I assume these parts have a lot less uh, cost than an FTDI chip is and that's probably why the manufacturers use these sort of off-brand parts. One of the things you might have spot, spotted looking at the card was that there's a 12 megahertz crystal next to that. USB to serial chip and uh, apparently it's part of the design. It looks like you need to have a 12 megahertz crystal hooked up to that FPGA or to that uh, part, FTDI type part. The FPGAs in that generation all required multiple power supply voltages. Uh, they don't run off the 5 volts so the, here are the three, three regulators for the 1.2, 2.0, 
2.5 and 3.3 volts that the card used. Hopefully the I.O. is all hooked up to 3.3. That would be what I would really prefer. A nice touch here are the three test points for apparently for measuring the three voltages. That's, that's a really nice touch. Um, hopefully that'll be not something I have to check, but there it is. The VGA uses a bunch of summing resistors. I believe it's 16 bits. Uh, most of the designs that I've messed around with are only 8 bits, which is uh, or 6 bits, 2 bits per color, which uh, usually 64 colors seems like it's plenty. 16 bits here, I believe, is uh, split up as 5, 6, and 5, which I think the green is 6 bits, but we'll play around with that and see if that's the case. Um, 16 bits of VGA color is a lot of color, and uh, maybe unnecessary for a retro computer, where uh, that would have certainly been out of the first generation of computers' capabilities. But very nice to hook up VGA to monitor you probably have sitting around in your house. Um, many of us have a lot of them and uh, maybe even have TVs that have VGAs on them. There are also four switches on the card. Um, I believe that one of them may be a reset. I'm not quite sure. Um, if so, it would have been nice to label it, but maybe it's uh, software to find. I really don't know. We'll find out as we play with that as well. Also in the bottom corner here is a buzzer. Um, again, maybe something that might have some fit in a retro computing area and we'll see. One of the first things that I like to do when I get a board is to mount standoffs on it and the holes uh, seem to fit quite nicely with 440 screws. There's probably a metric size that corresponds to that as well. But this keeps the card off the table and maybe some dirt and other things off it. Although this card doesn't have anything on the bottom. If you're looking at getting one of these cards I'm hopeful that the video helped you or maybe uh, taught you a little bit about a new card here. Um, I think we'll have a lot to learn and I'll try to keep up putting up videos on my YouTube channel as I learn more about the card and uh, hopefully put up some decent applications. Uh, I think it's going to be okay for a retro computer, but my, my guess at the moment is it's going to be difficult to access the SDRAM and getting that working and uh, it may be, end up being limited. One of the things that I would really like to have added would be an SD card and this doesn't have one on it and with the I.O. being shared I think between the PS2 VGA uh, connectors there really isn't enough. I think you need four lines for an SD card and I think that might limit this use. Uh, certainly keep it from becoming a, Z, a CPM machine with SD attached to it. Uh, would have happily given up connections to the LEDs or the seven segment LED in particular, maybe the buzzer, maybe a couple of buttons to get uh, more I.O. Um, but maybe that's something that designers can consider maybe if they make another spin of this card. I think there's a little bit of a market for retro computing stuff and I think this card is so close um, but maybe so far at the same time. Anyway, we'll take a look at it and uh, keep everybody posted on what we find. Thanks for watching our video and uh, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more information, you can see our wiki pages for these products and we have YouTube videos on them as well. We have a store in Tindy where we sell all of our cards. Thanks for watching our video and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.